All right, good evening. Couple y'all join in with me here in just a minute. Hey, Miss Samantha, Miss Rhonda, good to see y'all. Uh, Alex, Miss Tammy Barrett, hope y'all doing well. Brother Stacy, good to see y'all getting on here with me this afternoon. Hey, Miss Valerie, I hope you're doing well. I hope your son's doing well. And uh, hadn't heard, hey, Miss Amy. And uh, we'll give just a second or two here and um, let people get on. And I'm going to make just a couple announcements. And then after I make these announcements, we'll, we'll preach to you this afternoon what the Lord's laid upon our heart. And uh, make sure everybody hear me well. Everybody, everything okay? If one of y'all comment, like always, that you can hear me. Good evening, Brother Stacy. I miss y'all too. Our church family, I love you. It's uh good evening, Miss Tammy. If we um it's Wednesday night and typically we would take prayer requests on Wednesday night and uh let me get that turned down a little bit there. And we'd take prayer requests on Wednesday night normally, and so um if you have a prayer request, you you feel more than we, uh, welcome to type it into the comments and when all when we get done, when all this is over, I'll go back and I can read them and we'll be sure to pray for you. We'll be sure to, to uh, make your request known unto the Lord. And uh, again, appreciate all y'all getting on here listening this Wednesday afternoon at 6.30. It's been a tough week. It's been a tough week for Olive Baptist Church family. It's um, been a tough week uh, for a lot of folks. And uh, we ask you to pray for the Yon family. Um, for Stephen, Miss Susan, Victoria, their their moms, dads, the whole family there. As y'all know, that um, Tyshawn went on to be with the Lord sometime Sunday night, and uh, it came as a shock to all of us. It was hard, still hard, and oh my, that family really needs your prayers. If you'd hold that family up to the Lord, Tyshawn was so special to all of us. And uh, just a special man. And uh, when I say man, I mean a man. I mean a spiritual man. And uh, he he had the touch of God on his life. You could see it. He was working, serving, and uh, doing all that he could for the Lord Jesus. And uh, the Lord seemed fit to just call him on home. It was his time. And so we, we do appreciate you praying for that family. And uh, holding them up to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord knows they need it. Um, if you're wondering about the arrangements, I spoke with Brother Stephen. Uh, we've been speaking with him every day, but they were able to make the arrangements today. And uh, what they're going to do, and, and we're having, you know, it's just, a, it's just uh, we're having so much trouble with being able to gather in different things, but... Um, our governor issued that shelter in place, and it doesn't start until Friday at 5 p.m., the shelter in place. And so uh, we, the, the funeral will be Friday, but it'll be earlier than that. And so I hope I don't stutter too much. hope I don't make a mess out of this. If you have any questions, feel free to message me or let me know. Maybe somebody could even type um, the arrangements in the comments. I'll give them to you. For the family... It'll be at Olive Baptist Church, and uh, for this, the family, it'll begin at 12.30. The family will be there from 12.30 until 2 o'clock. Visitation for friends will be from 2 o'clock to 3.45 Friday afternoon. Family from 12.30 to 2. Friends of the family from 2 until 3.45 that afternoon. The services will be at Olive Baptist Church at 4 o'clock. And then we'll go to the graveside at Coal Town Cemetery in Purvis right after the 4 o'clock service at Olive. Now, the plans are um, we're going to gather outside of the church. Um, Tice will be there for viewing. Um, Brother Stephen, Miss Victoria, Miss Susan will be back away. I'm sorry, I had a phone call. I hope that don't happen again. First time that's happened since we've started these um these live services but so they'll be seated back so they ask that you can come through you can view Tice you can you can speak to the family but we're, we're going to practice social distancing there won't be 
There won't be hugging. There, uh, there won't be any of that. We're just asking that you respect that and respect the family. Um, I spoke with Brother Stephen today. He said everybody is welcome. You know, all the all the friends and the family, church family is welcome. But he says that in no way will they be dishonored if you don't want to come or you're unable to come because of the quarantine with the COVID-19 and different things. And so and so he said in no shape or form, if you're sick, he asked that you do stay home. Um, if you're elderly and, and you're afraid of that, he asked, please stay home. He said that it, it's not going to hurt their feelings. They won't be dishonored by that. They understand completely. And so that's Friday, the family from 1230 until 2. And then from 2 till 345, they'll have a viewing for all of our friends, all the friends of the family, church family. And then at 4 o'clock, we'll have a funeral service there. And then we'll leave there and go to the um, graveside at Coltown. You're welcome to come to the graveside. We're going to practice social distancing there. You'll be able to back up away and uh, perhaps hear from your car. Now, if you come to the church at 4 o'clock for the funeral service, um, if you have a chair and you'd like to bring it, we're going to try to separate people in groups of no more than four or five or six, somewhere right in there, and plenty of distance in between people. We're, we're just trying to do our part. As terrible as this seems and as hard as it seems, we are trying to do our part. And at the same time, we want to honor this young man we want to worship the Lord uh, uh, for this young man, and we want to love on and support this dear family. And so those those are the arrangements for Brother Tyshawn, and uh, you do pray for that family. You pray for Brother Stephen. You pray for um, Miss Susan, Miss Victoria, and uh, pray the Lord gives them grace. Our young people who are all so close to them, all ages, were so close to this young man. All of our teenagers and, and even the little ones, uh, Tice was so involved in their lives, and so it's really, really hit us all hard. And so we just ask you that you, you pray for this family, hold them up to the Lord in prayer. And so we, I think somebody had typed the arrangements. If you're just joining them, you can go back and you can um, look at those. That'll be Friday afternoon. Our governor's issued a shelter in place, and so in the meantime, we're going to continue to do church services just like this on Sunday, this coming up Sunday, 9 o'clock in the morning. We'll have church there. Amen. Well, not not there, here. Amen. You can come here if you want to, I guess. I'd rather you come here through the phone. So 9 o'clock Sunday morning, we'll do that. Again, I want to thank y'all for being so supportive of that. It speaks volumes about our church and about our church family and about people tuning in and listening and stay tuning in. And uh, the number of folk that stay on here while I'm preaching, you get to hear me all the time, and then, then you come in and hear me here and tune in, and that just speaks volumes about the heart of our people. And uh, if you're not a, a member at Olive Baptist Church or you don't attend church with us there and you watch this, man, we're so glad to have you on here. We're glad to have you listening, glad to have you tuned in. And uh, so we're just going to continue doing like that. Hey, Amen. We're going to continue to have 9 o'clock services here on Sunday, 6.30 on Wednesday night. I believe I have taught Brother Dustin Harrell and to get the Facebook account, I think, maybe. And um, hey, Brother Stephen, yeah, you, man, you are welcome. I've seen Brother Stephen's comment roll up. Brother, we love y'all. Thank you for listening this evening. We love you so much. Please let them know you love them. Amen. If you're watching right now, if you would, if you'd hit the love button for us, and uh, we want to show love to the Yon family. If you're tuned in and you're watching, um, hit that love button. Let them know that we love them. And Brother Stephen, I hope you see that. I hope it means something to you. And I hope it means something to your dear family. And uh, we love you. That's that's the best way that we can hug right now. That's the best That's the best way that we can do it. And so I see everyone on here. We love this family so, 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 so much. All right. So we're going to keep having church like this, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, 6.30 on Wednesday night. And uh, I think, like I said, I got Brother Dustin Harrell. I think I've got him talking into getting a Facebook account. I know our youth are doing an Instagram live tonight. Uh, Cole helped me just the other day figure out how to do YouTube live. So YouTube live. So this Sunday we may incorporate that for those who don't have Facebook. And uh, I, I don't I don't do real well at any of that. And um, 
but we're going to work it out. We're going to make sure that we get the Word of God out to everybody. So we're going to keep on doing what we're doing. Hey, I love you guys. I hope that you're taking care of yourself. I hope that you're being safe. I hope that you're thoughtful of those who are around you with all of this going on, and it's going to pass. It will pass. We will get well. We will overcome. All right, if you have your Bibles this evening, I hope that you do. And uh, I'd like you to open up to the book of John, chapter number 14. The book of John, chapter number 14. I've, I've had this passage of Scripture on my mind for several days now. And uh, I really wasn't sure the direction I would go with it or how, how I would approach this. And uh, came home came home tonight, uh, this afternoon from work after having these things bouncing around. I was able to sit down and and uh, go through some notes that I'd written down earlier, and uh, I, I hope that these will be a blessing to you. I hope that these will these will help you, and I hope these truths will minister to you on this Wednesday afternoon. Beautiful weather we're having. Amen. John chapter number fourteen in your Bibles tonight, and uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse number six. The book of John 14. I hope that you treat these like church. Take your Bible out, sit down, get your pen, get your pencil, get your paper. And uh, just like you would in a regular church service, take notes and be attentive to the Word of God. John chapter 14 and uh, verse number 1. Jesus says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Quick word of prayer, then I'll preach. Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, we ask you to bless this for the next few minutes. God, we ask you to touch it, anoint it with your spirit. God, we pray that in all of this, Jesus be magnified. That God, folks, should be drawn to you. God, tonight that they'd see you for who you are. God, we pray tonight for one that's watching who doesn't know you, who's lost. God, tonight be tonight. They be saved. Lord, we lift up the Yon family tonight. God, we we ask why, but God, we know that there is a reason. And God, tonight we trust that in due time that you'll show this dear family, God, how much you love them, how much you care for them, and how perfect your plan is. Touch them tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you listen and say amen. John chapter 14, and then I began reading in verse number one. Well, the days we live in are certainly full of a lot of questions, are they not? We, we have questions about everything. We look around and we wonder about so many different things, just so many different questions. I read to you from John 14, but in John 13, the disciples had, they had a lot of questions. You realize that the Messiah had come. They had been walking with him. They had been living with him. Everything they had ever knew had been turned upside down. Can I tell you this? That that's what Jesus will do in your life. He can turn it upside down, and I don't mean in a bad way. He can turn your whole world around. He can give you direction where you didn't have any. He can give you purpose where you didn't have any. Where you would have spent your life living it for you, and that's the best you could have ever done. Jesus gives us something to live for. But in John 13, they had questions. John 14 gives us this wonderful passage of Scripture that I just read to you, these promising verses that we read all the time and we hear about them all the time. Jesus, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And we know those verses over and over. But they were mentioned and they were spoke by the Lord for a purpose. If you'll read chapter number 13, you'll find out that the disciples had questions. They thought the Lord was on his way to Jerusalem to take his position upon the throne. But what they did not realize is, is before there could be a crown, there had to be a cross. They didn't understand that. They didn't realize that before he reigned, he had to be rejected. 
They didn't realize that before he could sit up on the throne, he first had to wear a crown of thorns. And in John 13, they have so many questions because what Jesus is telling them, they just don't understand. If you look in chapter 13 tonight, in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. The Bible says here that Jesus knew that his hour to depart had come. And what he does in chapter 13 is he prepares those disciples for the days that are coming. In the verses I read to you in chapter 14, he's preparing them for the days that they did not know what to think or did not know how to act. If you'll notice some of the acts of chapter number 13 here uh, that Jesus performs, you, you read through it a little bit later on, that he washes his disciples' feet. They didn't understand that. Jesus girded himself with a towel after that last Passover supper and he took these old dirty feet and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords began to bend down and wash his disciples' feet. They said, they said Lord, why? why? Why would you wash my feet? God, I'm a nobody. You're everybody. God, why would you wash my feet? Not only that, but the Lord tells them of his betrayal. He tells them that there'll be one that We'll betray him. And we know that he's speaking of Judas. And the disciples say, why? Why would anybody ever betray this man by the name of Jesus? I don't understand it. The Bible says that Jesus looks in chapter 13 in the end. And he looks at Simon Peter and he tells him, Simon Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. And Simon Peter says, Lord, I would never do that. Why? Why would I deny you? And after all these things that the Lord had done, all the disciples could ask was the question, why? You ever find yourself asking, why? You ever find yourself looking and saying, God, I just don't understand why? I heard a preacher say one day, and it meant so much to me because all I'd ever thought was that you could never ask God why. And I heard a great preacher who I think a lot of say this, that it's okay to ask Jesus why. Even, even Jesus asked why. As he hung up on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When we don't know why, the Lord knows why. I want to give you just a few things tonight about the question why. And that is the first one. Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write them down. I, when we don't know why, He knows why. Do you realize tonight that nothing takes our sovereign Lord by surprise? There's not one thing in mine and your life that has caught God without Him watching. In fact, the Bible says that He doesn't sleep, neither doth He slumber. And tonight, God's not up in heaven pulling His hair out, wondering how in the world that you and I are going to make it, or how all of this is going to work out, but He knows why. And you and I may not know why, but we can rest assured in the fact that no matter what comes, that God knows why. There's a reason behind every bit of it. The Bible says that He's working all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. You say, what do you mean by that? All things are not good, but He's working all things together for good. There's a reason behind everything in mind in your life, and it's okay that we ask why, but we need to understand that God knows why. How we find ourselves in days past, and in even months past, and even times, weeks past, that we say, God, why? Why does this have to happen this way? God, why does this have to go this way? But we know this, that the Lord knows why. Number two, you can write this down. Not only when we don't know why, He knows why, but you can write this down. Sometimes what we don't want is what God wants. And even though that we don't want it, doesn't mean that it's not the will of God. Sometimes what we don't want is what God wants. Look in uh, uh, verses 8 and verses 9 of chapter 13. Uh, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. 
The Lord stooped down, went to wash Simon Peter's feet, and Peter said, God, there ain't no way. Uh, thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head also. Simon Peter didn't want the Lord to wash his feet, but washing feet is what God wanted to do for Simon Peter. Do you realize that what Jesus is about to do in Simon Peter's life is about to be the greatest picture of servanthood that you and I could ever have? If you and I ever question the fact of whether or not we need to be servants of the king or not, we can look back at this passage of Scripture and say, even if the Lord washed Simon's Peter's feet, then I too must wash my brother's feet When we don't want something, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want it. Now these these disciples are full of question and we need to know that when we don't know why, the Lord knows why. Number two, we need to know this, that sometimes what we don't want is what God wants. But number three, we need to realize that when He wants us to know why, He will show us why. Chapter 13, verse 21, look at it with me. I hope you have your Bibles open when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Uh, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? In verse 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. When he wants us to know why, he'll show us why. But notice this, in verse number 26, they received the answer. They said, Lord, who is it? We, we need to know who. We, we don't have the answer for this. He said, it's going to be Judas. But then in verse number 28, All of a sudden, they got another question. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto them. No more did they get the answer to one question. There was another question in their life. And may I tell you this tonight, that the Christian life is full of whys. The Christian life is full of questions. The Christian life is full of wondering why this happened or why or why that happened. The Christian life is full of mountains and valleys. It's full of good times. It's full of bad times. The Christian life is full of easy times and it's full of hard times. But no matter what, that we do know this, that no matter what time it is, that He is Lord over all. Now keep that in mind with me, if you would, for just a moment. They've got all these questions of why. They don't know why. They understand the Lord knows why. They don't want one thing, but God wants what they don't want. Then God turns around and gives them the answer, and then He gives us the text that we read in the beginning. After all of the questions, and after all of the wondering, after all of the whys, after all of, I I don't understand this, and I don't understand that, and there's a lot I don't understand. But after all of that, Jesus looks at them, and in context, in chapter 14 says, In verse 1, but let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And he looks at them and says, but I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said in the midst of your question, let not your heart be troubled. Some things you and I don't understand, we won't understand. But we've got this promise from God that in the middle of it all, we don't have to let our heart be troubled. That we can believe in God, and we can believe in Christ, and we can rest in the firm foundation that He hath not left us forsaken nor wanting bread. That God has provided and God will continue to provide for us. I want to give you three things that I see from this chapter, and I do hope they'll be a blessing to you. Now, as I read these, I have these written down in the margin of my Bible. I I don't really know if I heard these three things somewhere. I don't know if they were original to me, but, but either way, I'm going to preach them to you tonight. I think they would be good. All I had was these three headings, so I, I think they'd be good for you. I believe this is where God would have me to be. 
that the Lord gives them this. Number one, write down in chapter 14 of the book of John, in verse number one, you'll find the command. Look at what Jesus said. He said in verse one, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Let it not be troubled. This almost seems to tell me as if I have a say-so in this matter. God says, let not your heart be troubled. Chapter 13 is full of the question, why? Why this? Why wash my feet? Why must you be killed? Why must you be betrayed? Why must I deny you is what Simon Peter says. Who is it going to be that betrays you? And Jesus said in the middle of it all, don't be sure you do this. Here's the command. Let not your heart be troubled. You know, the, the heart is not this. When we speak of the heart, we we tend to put our hands up on our chest and we, we point to that magnificent member that's inside of there that pumps blood and beats. But that's not the heart that Jesus was talking about. The word heart in John 14, 1 is the Greek word cardia and it refers to our thoughts, our feelings, our mind, our emotions, our will. God has given you and I a will. And Jesus says, in the middle of your questions, he looks at all those disciples and he says, I know you got a bunch of questions, but in the middle of them, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your feelings, your emotions, your will, don't let it be so troubled that it gets your mind off the place that I have prepared for you. You remember Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 21, that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That where your treasure is, that's where you're going to be fixed upon. And then he looks at them in John 14 and says, let it not be troubled. I've got to say so in this matter. You remember Paul wrote in Romans, I think it's chapter 6, he says, uh, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. In other words, sin's going to come by, and in mine and your life, doubt will come by. Romans 6, he's referring to the will of man, and he says this, now listen, temptation's going to come, but don't let it stay there. Don't let it reign there. Don't let it rule over you. And when Jesus says in John 14, listen, you're going to have questions. You're going to have doubts. You're going to have wonderings. You're going to wonder why. But don't let it control your will. Don't let it control your destiny. Have a say-so in the matter. Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, don't let your heart guide you. But rather, you need to guide your own heart. You realize you and I, you and I have a, have a, um, have the opportunity, we have the ability to guide the very will that God has put in us. We have the ability to steer ourselves in a certain direction. We have an ability to point ourselves to God. Oh, and I know sometimes it's hard not to be troubled. I realize sometimes, it, in fact, it is impossible for things to not trouble us and not bother us and not make us question why. But it is possible for us that in those times, instead of steering our own heart into the pit, that we steer our heart to the one who created us and loved us and cares for us. Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, take the rein of your heart. And though troubles may come, don't let it stay there. Don't let your heart guide you, but rather guide your heart. And he said, here's why in verse 2, he said, because in my Father's house are many mansions. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He said, you need to remember where you're headed. You need to remember the big picture of all this. You need to remember where you're going one day. I mean, tonight we can look at our own hearts and say, heart, if you're going with me, you're going to have to go somewhere. Heart, if you're going to stick with me, you're going to have to go somewhere. Heart, I'm not going to let you pull me down into the pit. But heart, if you're going to go with me, according to John 14, we're going to go to the Father. That's what he said. In my Father's house are many mansions. And heart, if you're going to hang around me, you're going to have to go to the Father with me. Amen. Isn't that how Jesus taught us to pray? He said, when you pray, pray. Uh, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, get yourself before the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I say to my heart tonight, heart, if you're going to hang around me a little while, you're going to have to go to the Father with me. Heart, if you're going to hang around me, you're going to have to go to His house with me. In my Father's house are many mansions, not where He visits, but where He stays. And heart, if you're going to go with me, you're going to have to go to the place uh, that He has prepared for me. Do you realize tonight that God has got a place for you, both eternal and fixed, both now and forever? And tonight, I don't have to let my heart 
bring me into the pit, but I can guide my own heart back to the one who cares for me. The worries and cares of this life can lead me down, but God has given me the ability to take the reins of my heart and guide it back to Jesus. Hope you have your Bibles open. Look back with me in Psalm 42 tonight. I want to read you some some verses that I love so much. The book of Psalms, chapter number 42. We're going to read some in Psalms, so I, I hope that you'll turn over there and stick with me just for a little while. Psalms, chapter number 42, in verse number 1. Here's what the Bible says. Psalm 42, verse number 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat both night, day and night. Now I know some people say, well, you if you're a Christian, you should never get down. If you're a Christian, you should never have a bad day. Friend, that ain't Bible and that ain't life. That ain't the way it is. David is a man after God's own heart and David still found himself in a place of despair, in a place that he was down. He says in Psalm 42, look, my tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? That's what his tears say to him. That's what his enemies say to him. Every emotion of life says, where's your God now? You're in such a hard time. Where is he now? He says in verse four, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. Then he asked himself the question, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, and I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. David said, My heart, my heart brings me down. It's trying to take me into the pit. He said, I recall in my mind going to the house of God and rejoicing with the people of God. I recall in my mind when everything was perfect and everything was well in life, but now he's in a place that it's not well and it's not perfect. He said, but the only help for me and only help for my soul is to hope in God and I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. Yet praise Him. Not for what He's done right now, but for what He's going to do tomorrow. And can I tell you tonight, if your heart's bringing you down to a place of despair, get a hold of the reins of it tonight. Refuse to let it stay there. Point it back to the One who loves you and saved you and died for you. Amen. I wish I could see y'all. Amen. I wish I could see you. I hope I'm preaching right to you tonight. Oh, he gives us the command, let not your heart be troubled. He says in Psalm 62, turn over there with me if you would, the book of Psalms, chapter number 62. You're going to have to turn with me there. I don't have all this out in front of me. Psalms 62 and verse number one. Uh, When you get there, wait on me. Uh, He says this, uh, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you, as a as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but their curse uh, they, they curse inwardly. My soul Wait thou only upon God. Oh, for my expectation is from Him. Oh, he, my soul waiteth upon God. From Him cometh my salvation. He is my rock. He is my salvation. He is my defense. May I say, like the psalm writer, when he said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And perhaps tonight, that's what you need to tell your heart. You need to be led to the rock that is higher than you. He is my rock. He is my foundation. He is my fortress, my firm defense. Oh, Isaiah chapter number 43. Isaiah says it like this in verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he hath formed thee. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the very fact that God formed us. God created us. Isn't that, isn't that a good thing that He knows us by name? I love that song. He knows my name. Every step that I take, every move that I make. And He says in Isaiah 43, Oh, but, but now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. 
I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to tell you the fix for a troubled heart. You remember who you belong to. When you get under the rock and you lean upon the rock, sometimes we don't have strength to stand. And we say, lead us to the rock that is higher than I. He said in verse 2 of, of Isaiah 43, when thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. You realize Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got put in a flaming fire, but they come out and they didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> Amen. The, the word of God is true. He said in verse 3, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopian and Saba for the. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus said this. He said, listen, when you got questions and you begin to wonder and you don't know why, he said this, John 14 is where we're at tonight. Let not your heart be troubled. That's the command. And it's impossible not to have a troubled heart. When we look at things that we face this week, Olive Baptist Church, precious friends of ours, dear families have faced this week. It is impossible to not be troubled. In fact, don't even think any kind of way that it's a sin if things like that trouble you because they do. But here's the promise of God. He says you don't have to stay there. He said you can get a hold of the reins of your heart instead of allowing them to lead you into the pit. He said you can get a hold of your heart and point it back to the one who loves you and saved you and died for you. Isn't that a wonderful thing? There is the command. Let not your heart be troubled. Rather than God letting your heart guide you, why not guide your heart? I hear people say all the time, well, I'm just following my heart. I'd be careful. I'd be careful following my heart. The heart's deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's what the Bible says. I'd, I'd, I'd be careful. Listen to my heart. I'm going to tell you what, your heart will deceive you, but you can get a hold of your heart. Let it not be troubled. Let it lead you back to Jesus. The command. There it is right there in John 14, verse 1. Jesus said, you've got questions. He's answering chapter 13, and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Number two, notice the context of this passage of Scripture. John chapter 14 is preceded by chapter 13. Now, I'm glad for the men in old times that, that uh, I, I, I'm glad for the translators who divided our Bibles up in chapters and verses. verses. It'd be hard to find your place in the Bible if that wasn't so. It'd be hard to do. I'm glad for the translators of old who, who by, uh, by a, a very intentful hand divided into chapters and verses. But if you was to read this the way that it was originally written, there'd be no separation between chapter 13 and chapter 14. You would just end up reading there in, in verse number 38 of 13, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me. He's talking to Peter. And then he would have said this, let not your heart be troubled. So notice the context with me of this verse. Uh, the, the very next verse after he tells Peter he's going to deny him is, you're going to deny me. You, you're going to mess up. You're, you're going to drop the ball, friend. But let not your heart be troubled. Does that make sense to you? When things don't go like you planned, let not your heart be troubled. Because you ain't going to always have your handle on it. You and I ain't always. I know I ain't, ain't a word. I ain't going to use it, whatever. Okay. Uh, uh, we ain't always going to have a handle on it. We ain't always going to have the fix on things. Uh, we ain't always going to have control of everything. But even if we don't, even when we mess up, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. When you drop the ball, don't let it be troubled. Uh, when, when you have doubt, that you have no answers to, don't let it be troubled. When there's questions in your life that you don't have the answers to, you don't have it figured out. I, I, man, I'm going to tell you what, a, a pastor, it's taken me a long time and I still hadn't learned this, I don't think, but but I, I have to convince myself I don't have all the answers. I don't I don't have all the answers. I think sometimes pastors, maybe you're a pastor and you're watching and we feel like, man, we better have the answers for everything. But there's a lot of things we just don't have the answers for. God never called us to be professors or psychiatrists, by the way, men. God's called us to be preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's called us to be under shepherds, under him, over the flock which he hath made us overseers. That's what he called us to do. None of that means you have to have all the answers. Amen. And when you don't have all the answers, 
don't let your heart be troubled. When doubt comes, don't let your heart be troubled. Now, I don't mean that we ought to use that as an excuse for sin. I don't mean that we ought to say, well, I'm going to go mess up. I ain't going to be troubled by it because Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Listen, when you sin and I sin and we mess up, there's a way to fix that. We confess it to the Lord. If we say that we have no sin, well, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. But if we do sin and we'll confess our sin, the Bible said he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, if you have messed up and you have dropped the ball and you have got caught up in a lifestyle of sin, I got good news for you tonight. You can fix it. Amen. You can confess it to Jesus. You don't need a pope. You don't need anybody else. You can confess it to Jesus. He'll forgive your sin. That's what the Word says. You can repent of that sin, turn around, go the other way, and God said He would put it under the blood. Hallelujah. And so this verse says, Simon Peter, you're going to deny me. That's what he said at the end of chapter 13. Then chapter 14, he says, but when you do, let not your heart be troubled. It's not an excuse to sin. We ought to deal with sin. We ought to hate sin. The great missionary John Owen said we ought to kill sin before sin kills us. But I do believe the context of this. Jesus is saying, you're going to mess up, but when you do, don't let it be the end of the world. You ain't going to have answers, but when you do, don't don't let it be the end of the world. When it comes to the things of this life that are out of our control, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled because I am in control. Oh, my goodness. I wish I was in church right now. I'd stand up on a pew and shout, amen. He is in control. When it all goes haywire, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said he's got it fixed. (laughs) Amen. And he is the Lord of all. So when nothing makes sense, we see the command, let not your heart be troubled. Number two, we see the context. Uh, Listen, when when you mess up, you don't know why or you don't know the answers, Jesus said, don't let it be troubled. Don't let your heart guide you. You guide your heart. Grab the reins and point it back to Jesus. But number three, I'm going to say this. I see in these verses the cure. The cure for a troubled heart. He said in verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Jesus said, believe also in me. I believe that the cure for a troubled heart is something as such as simple as faith. Do you believe that tonight? It's so simple as faith. I like that. Oh. Is it an acrostic? Is that what you call it when you take a word and you take a word and you take every letter of that word and make it say something? And I love that acrostic. uh, Faith for all, I trust him. Well, that's what what faith is. Jesus said, hey, Simon Peter, you deny me? Oh, really? Didn't take God by surprise. Uh, Jesus told Simon Peter he'd deny him before he ever did. Sometimes, God, I mean, I look at God, God, I'm sorry. I I never knew I'd do that. Didn't take the Lord by surprise. It may have surprised me. It hadn't surprised our sovereign Lord. He knows. He cares. He sees. And when he said, when things come, let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it talk you off your horse. Take a hold of your heart. Guide it back to me. You believe in God? He said, believe also in me. That is the cure, the command, the context. When somebody messes up, but then there is the cure, faith. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let me ask you something tonight. Do you believe in God? Do you have faith? When I ask you to believe in God, do you believe that that God created you? Do you believe that He took man, formed him from the dust of the earth, breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and man became a living soul? Do you believe that tonight? When you look out at the heavens and the stars that even declare the glory to God, do you look at that and say, man, whatever happened, we must have evolved here someday? Or do you look at that and say, man, how great is our God? When you look at how intricate the human life is and how fearfully and wonderfully made we are, does it not say that, that listen, that we have a great God? When we, when we look at how He provides for the sparrow and He provides for me and you, when we look at how faithful and true the Word of God is, how that line upon line and precept upon precept has been fulfilled. When we look at the faithful and just witness that God has left us, does it not make us say, yes, I 
I believe in God. Did Paul not say in Romans that, hey, you're without excuse, old man, that you look up into heaven and that you see that he's there, and tonight you may want to deny the fact that he's there, and it simply boils down to you don't want to know that he's there, but even, even anybody who's listening or watching tonight has to look at this universe and us and the provision of it and say, I believe in God. And Jesus said, you believe that? He said, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. It is as simple as faith. Jesus said, you believe in God. You believe also in me. He said, you want the cure for troubled heart? Believe in me. Can I tell you tonight that Christ is, he's still the answer. He's still got the answer to our questions. He still is the cure to our life. He still is the help that me and you need. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us what faith is. And I said, faith is the cure for a troubled heart. We got to trust him for all. I trust him. Hebrews chapter 11, you you know those verses. And uh, I could probably quote it, but I don't want to misquote it tonight. Hebrews chapter number 11 and uh, verse number 1. Here's what the Bible says about faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You remember what we said hope was Sunday? Hope's not wishful thinking. Hope is our the promise of God based upon His Word. That is our hope that God will keep His Word. And I can tell you tonight, God will. Now that's what faith is. It is a substance of things hoped for. It is us believing that God will do what He said He would do. Now, I still believe that. I still believe that one day He's going to step out in the clouds. Amen. And at the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I still believe that. I still believe the Bible says he's coming back to the earth after that. And he's going to be up on a white horse whose vesture is dipped in blood. King of kings and Lord of lords, he's bringing an army with him. He's bringing me and you. We're going to come back. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. I believe that. I still believe that He's provided a place for us, fixed a place for us. It is the cure for all my troubles. All my hope is in Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, you've got to believe in God. We've talked about that, but you've got to believe that He is who He said He is. That Jesus Christ is the incarnate Word of God. He is God Himself. The very, the very person of God came to this earth, lives this life, crucified by man, buried in the grave, rose three days later, and he's the, he is the bridegroom of a great bride of the church of the living God. Now, now Hebrews says you've got to have faith. He says here's what faith is, the substance of things hoped for based upon God's promises, the evidence of things not seen. Then he gives some, some examples of people who live by faith, by it, the elders obtain a report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed. That's what we talked about. By the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead. Look, look, he says in verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. The Jesus said, You believe in God, believe also in me. Now you believe in God, you believe also in him. Oh, tonight... Tonight, do do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is? Because he that cometh to God must believe that he is. You you, you gotta believe that he is all that he said he was. He was not just a man. He was the God man. He was not just a prophet. Boy, he was the prince of preachers. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The cure for my troubles is that my hope is in who Jesus said he was. I can see him as these disciples. Chapter 13, they're asking him questions. Why you got to die? Why you got to do this? Why why has it got to happen this way? Jesus said, these things going to happen, but boys, let not your heart be troubled. I am who I said I am. I'll do what I said I'll do. And guess what he did? They placed him in that grave. Grave couldn't hold him three days later. And because he lives, we live. Oh, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Our hope's not in a grave in a box. It's in Jesus Christ, the the, uh, the maker of our soul, the lover of our soul who loved himself, gave himself for us. That sometimes we get trouble. Mark chapter number nine, you remember Jesus and his disciples are returning from the Mount Transfiguration. 
They come back down. There's a boy there that's possessed with a devil. Those disciples tried all that they could do. I think we're a little bit too hard on them sometimes. Oh, they couldn't even cast out a devil. Yeah, right. They prayed and Jesus looked at them and he says, uh, these things cometh not but by prayer and fasting. Jesus, though, the young man's boy cried out and he made this statement to the Lord. He said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Isn't that so true that sometimes doubts come and try to sweep us off our feet? Sometimes a worry comes and tries to knock us down and say, now that you're down, stay down. But we got to remember this, that in my Father's house are many mansions. And hard, if you're going to go with me, you're going to have to go to the Father. You're going to have to go to His house. And you're going to have to go to the place that He prepared for me. For me, by Him, in Him. Christ is in me. I am in am in him. That's the cure for this troubled heart. We got families this night. Boy, they got a troubled heart. We, we've suffered some great tragedy this week. And I know, I know, dear brother, I know your heart is troubled. But can I tell you this right now? That Jesus will carry you. God's going to keep you. And God's going to do everything that he ever said he would do. He will not fail. He cannot. He will not forsake. He cannot. He will be God. Hey, I love you tonight. He is the Lord. If you're listening to me tonight, you're not saved. If you've made it this far and you listen and you're saying, I don't have this hope. I don't I have troubled and I can't get myself to him. Tonight be the night you could. Tonight be the night you get saved. I'd love to take my Bible, show you how to be saved. 601-590-1879. Please feel free to call me anytime, any hour concerning your soul. I'd be glad to tell you what the Bible says. You can have peace tonight. You can have rest. And it's all in Jesus' name. Let your heart and heart not be troubled. That is the cure. Our faith and our trust in Christ. Hey, church, I love you. I love you. Appreciate you. Please continue to pray for us. Um, I'm, I'm feeling a whole lot better. I'm pretty good. Um, please pray for the On family. We mentioned the service times and arrangements at the beginning of this video, probably the first five, six, seven minutes. You can go back and watch it after it's done if you're just tuning in. Um, our church services, you know, we've got this shelter in place starting at 5 o'clock Friday by our governor. And we do want to abide by the law. We want to abide. Uh, we want to we wanna honor that. And so we're going to continue to have church on here Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, Wednesday night at 6.30. Next Wednesday night, if you're thinking about it this week, and uh, look up Jessica and Dustin Harrell, he's supposed to be getting a Facebook account. He may preach to you on here next Wednesday night. And uh, read these comments. And Brother Stephen says, my entire family is listening. We love y'all. We need him. But Stephen, we, we love you. Every one of us, I promise you that. We love you, and we're here for you. We're praying for you. Thank you for praying for us. Get those arrangements um, one more time. 12.30 for the family at Olive. Visitation from 2 to 3.45 for visitors. Funeral service at 4. And then we'll leave Olive Baptist Church and go up to Cold Town Cemetery after that service. We're going to practice social distancing. We are going to, if you've got a chair, maybe you can bring it. We're going to divide up in groups of maybe four or so. And uh, out in the churchyard, and we're, we're going to do the best that we can do. We're not going to hug. Um, and Brother Stephen told me to tell every one of you that if you don't feel comfortable, if you if you're, feel like you may be sick or you don't want to get sick or you're elderly, that they would not be dishonored in any kind of way by you staying home. They know that you love them, and, and they're, they, want, they want to keep folks safe too. And so that's, that, that was straight from Brother Stephen. And uh, so, so that's what we'll that's what we'll plan on. Thank y'all for joining in. Over a hundred folks on Wednesday night. I thank God for that. It says a lot about the heart of our people. And uh, if you're visiting too, you know, and you're just listening, visiting, listening, <laughs> we, we're thankful to have you here. You feel welcome. You're just as much of a part of us. Okay, okay. We love y'all tonight. Share it uh, in the video, and, and maybe somebody else will hear it. Maybe somebody else needed that. And y'all stay safe this week. If y'all need me, give me a call. Um, I, I believe that some folks have been sending their tithe checks in. Um, and so, you know, the, the, please don't forget about that. 
You don't forget about your opportunity to worship God in your giving. I don't ever mention money. If you know me, I don't ever mention money. And, uh, but I have to here. I, I have to remind y'all, hopefully, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll send that in. Okay, we love you tonight. 30 Olive Church Road, Lumberton, Mississippi. That's the church's address, 39455. 30 Olive Church Road. Okay, all right. We're going to sign off. We'll talk to you a little bit later this week. We love you. Amen.